This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Green for the year. On this St. Patrick's Day, the Dow goes positive for 2016, erasing all of the turmoil of January and February. Tackling entitlements, what the Speaker of the House wants to do with social programs few want to touch. Fill her up, grab a taco, or go for a swim. An entrepreneur's journey that proves everything is bigger in Texas. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, March 17th. Good evening, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. A stunning turnaround. The Blue Chip Dow Index is now positive for 2016. Who'd have thunk it? It erased losses from the market's worst start to a year ever and reversed a remarkable 2,000-point drop from the recent low. Today's climb was helped by a rise in oil prices and continued enthusiasm following yesterday's Fed decision to alter its interest rate hike forecast. The Dow Jones Industrial Average... Gained 155 points to 17,481. NASDAQ added 11. The S&P 500, briefly positive for the year two, climbed 13. So while there are a number of things working in the market's favor, there are also a host of things that aren't. Bob Pisani explains. It was another up day, this time on the weak dollar. And yet, there's a lot of skepticism. What's the problem? Here's the good news. What some are calling the Goldilocks market. First, there's no recession in sight. Second, interest rates are low. Third, inflation's up a little bit, but not significantly. And most importantly, the jobs market is in good shape. Given that, why does the market continue to have such a tentative feel to it? And why did Janet Yellen seem to reflect that tentative feel? It seems to go beyond the somewhat boilerplate FOMC statement that global economic and financial developments continue to pose risks. The short answer is that there is far more pain, anxiety, and danger in the U.S. economy than the statistics suggest. Growth is slow, wages are stagnant, and there's a lot of sort of disappeared workers in the economy who don't look for jobs or who don't even qualify for jobless benefits anymore. And that's why we have Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And this is why we have a very cautious Fed. They are not just looking at jobs and inflation, which is theoretically their sole mandate. The FOMC is looking at the overall state of the economy and the fact that Trump and Sanders have gone so far this year on the dissatisfied vote is not lost on Yellen and company. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange. So let's turn now to two market pros to discuss what they think is working in the market and what is not. Joining us is David Kelly, Chief Global Strategist with J.P. Morgan Funds, and Jack Ablin, Chief Investment Officer at BMO Private Bank. Uh, Jack, I'm going to start with you. I think you err on the side of things are not quite as good as a lot of people think they are in this market. Yeah, you know, if you look at some of the metrics that we look at, yeah, I think the economy is doing okay and uh, jobs are certainly being created. Uh, but if you really look at valuation, if you just try it, uh, tie it back to profits, uh, there really isn't a very strong connection. In fact, part of the reason why we had such trouble in January was because we were going through fourth quarter earnings results. My sense is as we start moving into April, we're going to have the same problem once we look at first quarter numbers. Um, David, the other thing is, is liquidity. I mean, that's, that's, that's drying up as well. David Kelly, address uh, Jack's concerns here, particularly the one having to do with profits. My guess would be that maybe the market is looking six to ten months ahead and saying that by the time we get into the summer and fall, profits may be improving. Uh, well, I, I, what happened in the first quarter is we had a panic attack. It wasn't a heart attack. It was a panic attack. Uh, people got unreasonably scared about what was going on in China. And a lot of people started talking about recession. And, you know, Bob Pisani was talking about pain and anxiety and danger. Uh, I don't agree with the pain. I don't agree with the danger. But there is a lot of anxiety. I mean, the media latched onto this idea of recession, uh, even though there was no basis for it whatsoever. Uh, and then we saw also, you know, uh, the political candidates talk about America being in decline. Uh, we've got, uh, and of course, Janet Yellen herself, in order to, uh, to justify this extremely easy monetary policy, the Fed itself was talking down the economy. So all of this, I think, is adding to anxiety. But the economy itself, you know, it's, it's a slow-growing economy. That's what we've got. But the, the profit decline, I do think, is temporary. It's about the dollar. It's about oil. They've reversed. I think you'll see a big reversal in profits uh, by the end of this year. Okay, Jack. So, you know, do you think that we are going to see a fairly decent market year, given the recovery that we've seen, even if there is some pain out there? Well, I think we, we have uh, maintained our defensive position. 
David, let, let me pick up with you as we try and restore our signal with, uh, with Jack Ablin. Uh, as we move into this uh, first quarter pr uh, profit uh, reporting season, which will happen in about three weeks from now, what do you expect to see? Is, is it likely to be unsettling or encouraging? I don't think... No, I, I think it should be basically encouraging. The key thing is to separate out the dollar effect, on, which still will, the dollar will still be up year over year, and that's hurting, and particularly the oil effect. But once you look past those, I think, and I think people will get more used to looking past those, uh, I, think th I think things will look better. Uh, and, and also, you know, uh, we'll get an employment report, uh, which should look pretty good. Uh, and so long as things are still calm in China, I think we can build on, on uh, the recent momentum here. So what does that... Where does that put the Fed at this point, David? They didn't move this time, and yeah. they slashed the number of times that they are expecting to be able to raise rates this year. Yeah, they, I honestly think they keep on getting this wrong. I don't think that these low rates are actually stimulating the economy. The economy is doing okay, but it's not because of what the Fed's doing. But the problem is they keep on pushing out the day when they're going to begin to raise rates. And, you know, someday we will have a recession, and someday we'll need their help again, and someday we'll need them to cut rates. But if they never raise rates, they'll never be able to cut them. So I, I think they're making <laughs> a grave mistake by, by keeping rates this low for this long. They should have raised them last summer. They got scared out of doing it then. They got scared out of doing it now. And now they're sort of saying they're going to take it easy here. I just think they are way too easy. And this is eventually this is going to add, end badly. I just don't think it's going to end badly this year. All right. David Kelly with J.P. Morgan Funds. Thank you. And Jack Ablin, we apologize for the technical glitch. He's with BMO Private Bank. Ty? Some positive news today. If you're looking for a job, the number of job openings rose to more than five and a half million in January. But the Labor Department also reports that actual hiring fell to the lowest level since late 2014. A separate report showed that initial claims for state unemployment benefits rose from a five month low by 7,000 last week. Despite the rise, the level is still consistent with a strengthening labor market. The current account deficit, which measures the flow of goods, services, and investments in and out of the country, narrowed in the fourth quarter. But for all of last year, the deficit jumped to its highest level in seven years. Weakness in major overseas economies and the stronger dollar have reduced our export sales. Investors are always on the hunt for yield, even in an up market, and the most popular place to find that income is with dividends. But as Mike Santoli tells us, it's not just the payout that investors need to pay attention to. Dividends have always been an important driver of investors' long-term stock returns. But with global interest rates so low and safe sources of yield growing scarce, dividends have become even more crucial for income-oriented investors. With central banks around the world having bought trillions in bonds to help suppress interest rates, many investors feel forced to use blue-chip stocks to earn reliable income. And such companies seem happy to oblige. The total dollar value of S&P 500 dividends is up 95 percent since 2009. This helps explain why such steady dividend payers as Coca-Cola, Waste Management and Kellogg have seen their shares hit new highs lately. Now, while demand for dividend yielding stocks might be helping to support the market in this uncertain economic environment, investors should be aware that stocks are not good outright substitutes for bonds. They can swing dramatically in value and won't stabilize a portfolio the way bonds can. And many dividend-rich sectors of the market already appear richly valued, such as utilities, telecom, and consumer staples. This may restrain these stocks' long-term appreciation potential. So if you buy a stock mainly for its dividend, it helps to be content with collecting that income alone and to be tolerant of possible downturns along the way. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mike Santoli. So while the stock market is climbing, there's one stock that is not participating, Valiant. Earlier this week, the company slashed its revenue forecast and delayed its 10K filing. But the selling in the stock began months ago on accusations by a short seller and scrutiny from Washington over drug price increases. This year alone, shares are down about 70 percent. And as Meg Terrell reports, Valiant's creditors are starting to get antsy. The uncertainty continues for Valiant Pharmaceuticals. The biggest immediate concern? The company's more than $30 billion of debt. Because the embattled drug maker hasn't filed its annual report for 2015, it risks triggering defaults with its bondholders. The company says it'll negotiate with its creditors to extend the deadlines, though some fear the terms could be onerous. Valiant may pursue asset sales to pay down its debt faster. BMO Capital Markets estimates the company has about $6 billion of assets it could potentially divest 
ranging from its neurology business to some prescription eye drugs and its dentistry unit. The company has said paying down debt is a key priority for the year. And finally, investors are wondering where growth will come from for Valiant. The company this week outlined six of its leading drivers, but some doubt their prospects. The first is a bowel drug that Valiant acquired in its $11 billion purchase of Salix last year. The problem? A patent challenge from rival Allergan. Though analysts expect the drug is protected from generic competition into the 2020s, some see reason for caution. Intellectual property analysis firm MCAM raises some red flags around the defensibility of some of the drug's patents. Another growth driver Valiant highlights? An experimental psoriasis drug. Though there's a need for new psoriasis drugs, this one has run into problems in the past. Amgen discontinued a partnership on the medicine because it was associated with suicidal thoughts. Nonetheless, some analysts say with proper safety labels, the drug may find a place on the market. After the six months Valiant has had, the best thing shareholders may be able to hope for in the near term is stability. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. And still ahead, SeaWorld's decision to phase out its most famous attraction. SeaWorld is getting a makeover. Under pressure from critics, the theme park operator is getting rid of its killer whale shows, the one thing it's best known for. The company's new direction was cheered by investors who sent the shares higher. Morgan Brennan has more now on SeaWorld's big changes. SeaWorld is phasing out its most famous attraction, killer whales. Bowing to years of public pressure, the theme park operator will stop breeding them immediately, meaning its 24 existing orcas across three marine parks will be the last generation in company captivity. And that's not all. SeaWorld also announcing it will end theatrical shows involving the whales at all of its locations, from California to Texas to Florida, replacing them with new orca encounter exhibits that will begin rolling out next year. It's a huge shift for a company that became a top tourist draw in the 1970s, thanks to its Shamu shows. But times have changed, and today's move is in response to backlash in the wake of Blackfish, a 2013 documentary that was critical of SeaWorld's treatment of orcas, leading to battles with animal rights activists and with state regulators in California, where the uproar has been most pronounced. That's resulted in falling earnings, waning attendance, and ballooning costs as the company has tried to resuscitate its brand. The result? A stock plunge from nearly $40 a share in mid-2013 to about $18 today. In a Los Angeles Times op-ed, SeaWorld CEO Joel Manby writing, quote, We are proud of contributing to the evolving understanding of one of the world's largest marine mammals. Now we need to respond to the attitudinal change that we helped create. Part of that is a new educational partnership with a previous critic, the Humane Society. Shares of SeaWorld jumped on the news today, and analysts applauded the changes. KeyBank Scott Haman believes it will have a positive impact on the public's perception, a, quote, step in the right direction in terms of stabilizing current trends and setting the company up for longer-term growth. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. Caterpillar lowering its first quarter guidance, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The world's largest mining and construction equipment maker sets, sees its quarterly earnings up to a third lower than Wall Street expected. The company also taking down its revenue target, but yet it still maintained its full year forecast. Despite the weakened guidance, shares ended the day up a little more than 2% to 75.90. The retailer Land's End saw a loss in its fourth quarter due to declining sales, among other things. While the company saw its profits fall sharply, its revenue decline was less than analysts expected. The overall results were enough to keep investors happy, with shares up on this positive day well over the 3% to 2515. Profit at the arts and crafts supplier Michaels grew 17% in the fourth quarter of last year. Despite the strong results, the company warned investors it faces challenges this year, such as unfavorable exchange rates. The stock getting a sizable lift on the results, up more than 12% to 2744. Drug distributor McKesson announcing a series of layoffs late Wednesday night as it looks to cut costs. The company said it will lay off about 1,600 jobs in the U.S. That's about 4 percent of its workforce. Shares fell more than 2.5 percent to 151.69. 
Software maker Adobe saw record revenue last quarter thanks to strong growth in its cloud products. Adobe also raised its full year guidance based off of those strong results. Shares of Adobe initially rose following the After the Bell news after closing the regular session up 2% to 8996. Earlier this week, we told you about a possible deal in the energy sector, and now TransCanada announced after the bell today that it is buying Columbia Pipeline Group for $25.50 a share in a deal valued at about $13 billion. U.S.-based shares of TransCanada down initially in after-hours trading, while shares of Columbia Pipeline sparked initially in the after-hours. Social Security, Medicare, reforming these entitlement programs is a big issue on the campaign trail. Republican frontrunner Donald Trump has said he won't touch them. But that's not what House Speaker Paul Ryan thinks should be done. John Harwood spoke to Mr. Ryan exclusively. If we do not prevent Medicare from going bankrupt, it will go bankrupt. And that will be bad for everybody. We have to tackle our debt crisis. We have to tackle the drivers of our debt, upcoming debt. And I think, uh, I think, I hope that whoever our, our standard bearer is going to be will acknowledge that. But if presidential leadership is the indispensable agree, uh, ingredient for entitlement reform, as everybody said and has for a long time, mm -hmm. doesn't it mean if, if you nominate and elect a candidate who says don't touch them, it's not going to happen? Well, I'd like to think that he, he will uh, see what is going on with these programs. He says don't touch anybody. Well, I disagree with that. I think for younger people like myself, they're not going to be there for my generation when we retire. You have to change these benefits to prevent them from going bankruptcy. But Donald Trump is running against candidates in the Republican primary who agree with you on entitlement reform and beating them. Yeah, well, I think what he's beating mean? them for lots of reasons. Do we have a debt crisis coming in America? Yes, we do. Should we do something to prevent that from happening? Yes, we should. On taxes, your predecessor as Ways and Means Chair, Dave Camp, when he came out with a comprehensive tax reform a few years ago, he adopted as a principle that it was going to be distributionally neutral. It wasn't going to advantage any group over the current system. Is that still a principle that you think is appropriate for... Yeah. So I do not like the idea of buying into these distributional tables of, of what you're talking about is what we call static distribution. Mm -hmm. It's a ridiculous notion. What it presumes is life in the economy is some fixed pie and it's not going to change and it's really up to government to redistribute the slices more equitably. That is not how world, the world works. That's not how life works. And you're not worried... You can shrink those... or expand the economy and what we want to maximize is economic growth and upward mobility so that everybody can get a bigger slice of the pie. But you're so not that worried that those blue-collar Republican voters uh, who are voting in these primaries right now are going to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, you're taking care of people at the top more than you're taking care of me. Most people don't think John's success comes at my expense or my success comes at your expense. People don't think like that. Bernie Sanders talks about that stuff. That's not who we are. John Harwood joins us now. John, great interview first. Um, Thank you, can, sir. can the Republicans really bridge that gap that you mentioned between Paul Ryan and Donald Trump? Well, in some areas they can. Uh, Donald Trump's tax plan is like many other Republican tax plans, only bigger. Uh, so I'd expect that uh, Paul Ryan and Donald Trump could do some business on taxes, much harder on issues like trade. Although when I talked to Ryan, he said, well, Republican voters, they're not against uh, trade deals or Donald Trump's not against trade deals. They're just against bad trade deals. But we do have one on the table right now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Paul Ryan is for. So that is a difficult uh, gap to bridge because Donald Trump says the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the worst deal ever negotiated. So what about bridging the gap between Mr. Ryan, the Republican Congress, and Hillary Clinton if she is uh, the eventual winner in November? Can they do that? Can they do business? <laughs> well, Tyler, that's what's really interesting. You know, what Paul Ryan told me was we need a clarifying election in this country in order to solve our big problems. And I said, well, what if uh, a Democrat wins that? And he says, well, is this going to be more of the same like we've had over the last several years? We're not going to make progress on our problems. So uh, if that happens, if Republicans hold the House and, and a Democrat wins the White House, uh, it is not looking to be a pretty picture in terms of compromise unless somebody changes course in a significant way. You have the best beat in the world, especially <laughs> this year, John. Thanks Thank so much. So. John Harwood in Washington. Ty? And coming up, it is giant, it is odd, and it is very lucrative. Meet the entrepreneur who turned a truck stop into a whole lot more.
Most every car in the U.S. will have automatic emergency braking by the year 2022. Yesterday, we told you the deal was close to being announced, and today, 20 automakers made it official. The safety feature will be standard on most new cars in just a few years. Nike goes back to the future with self-tying sneakers. The shoes have power-operated laces. As soon as you put your foot in, you press a button, and they tighten up. Look at that. Whoa. I think there's a wide range of people that are really interested in this whole self-lacing adaptive performance. Uh, obviously, you have the sneaker heads who are all over it. I mean, this has been a buzz for them for years. There was actually a write-in petition to Nike to power through and get the power laces in uh, a product. So uh, it's, it's great to be able to put a product out there that is, is a step toward the future of adaptive performance. And Nike plans to sell them later this year in the increasingly tech-driven athletic market. As they say, if you build it, they will come. And that's exactly what happened to one entrepreneur who opened a gas station in Dallas. But not just any old gas station. Jane Wells has the story. Fuel City is a gas station with cheap gas and easy freeway access in the middle of downtown Dallas. Last year, sales reached $25 million. What? How? We'll have eight or ten people here at night making tacos. Karaoke is in front of the palm tree. It's on the weekends. We've got a swimming pool, which is a lot of fun. We have a dinosaur. You might call it a truck stop, but owner John Bindo won't. I say it's some place where dreams come true, Fuel City. This is our strangest success yet. I love to work. I worked in department stores, was a lifeguard, was a substitute teacher, interviewed to be Bozo the Clown in South Texas when I was going to college. This serial entrepreneur started Fuel City in his late 40s. I was doing jury duty down the street and during lunch break I found this spot. This spot is eight acres where in 1999 Binda hoped to recreate his childhood ranch. I wanted a way to enjoy a ranch but have it in a city and let people see what Dallas looked like before it was a city. And when I got started in, in 99, it was real hard to sell it to a bank because I, when I showed them the swimming pool, they said, a swimming pool at a convenience store? I said, no, 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 it'll be cool. People want to come. The store cost four and a half million. I borrowed three and a half million. I put up a million dollars to buy the land and do finances. I had to put a second mortgage on my house. And then it was such a phenomenon. When I opened up, I thought nobody's going to come. How many tacos do you sell a day? A lot. <laughs> I had a graph on the wall, and I would graph my bank balance every day. And if I was going up, I was making it. If I was going down, I wasn't going to make it. 17 years later, Binda has expanded to two fuel cities, which did $39 million in sales last year, 80% from fuel. Two more are planned, even as Binda keeps testing what you might call city limits. Uh, we've had uh, White Buffalo got a ticket from the city because they said you can't have buffalo in downtown Dallas, and zebras and camels, and got in trouble for that and had to take them out. I'm thinking about putting in kangaroos. I think in the next five years I'll have a couple of giraffes. Wouldn't that be cool? The rest of this 65-year-old's bucket list isn't nearly so strange. I have goals in increasing my net worth. That's probably my number one thing. Two? $70 million by 70. How much are you making? How much am I making? A lot. <laughs> For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jane Wells. Stories you will only see here on Nightly That's Business right. Report. A six pack and a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> and a swimming pool. Don't forget the and swimming pool. And fill her up. Whoa. <laughs> All right, before we go, let's take another look at the rally on Wall Street, shall we? The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 155 points positive for the year now. Uh, at 17,481. Nasdaq added 11, and the S&P 500 nipped into positive territory. Couldn't quite hold it. It finished higher by 1337. Uh, I think he might have trouble with the kangaroos. Yep. That does it for Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for watching. We want to remind you this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support. And thank you for me as well. I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.